Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Myth Vision. What better day than to do a video about Dr. Richard C. Miller's work, Resurrection and Reception in Early Christianity. This is Easter. Jesus is risen. Hallelujah. Well, oftentimes what we find with academics, scholars in the field, is those who don't believe in the resurrection, they are trying to rationalize and explain what the earliest Christians actually had occur to make them believe in the resurrection of Jesus. And what I find quite powerful about the approach that Richard C. Miller does, by looking at the Greek and Roman world, and the various stories that would have been ubiquitous across the Greek and Roman world about the deceased and the porous boundary between the living and the dead and how they had structured legends and myths and stories and folk legend, the whole nine all across the Roman Empire, doing it to Caesars, doing it to demigods, the mortals who become gods, the whole nine yards. We get to Jesus, and what do academics who don't believe that Jesus rose from the dead do? They say, they say that in the beginning of this whole thing, some misunderstanding, someone thought they saw the risen Lord, and this isn't out of the question as a possibility, of course, but that Paul may have had a hallucination, or early Christians were so distraught over the death of Jesus that they started thinking they saw the Lord or experienced him after he died on the cross, and then began to pronounce, hey, I just experienced Jesus, he is risen. Then the legends and narratives tacked on to that. Now, while that's a plausible beginning, what I find quite powerful about Richard C. Miller's work as he takes the existing legend, the existing construct that Christianity has, and the earliest apologist, and how they were using it in trying to convince the Greek and Roman world about Jesus, and how this is the one religion that's true, they used the same constructs. So that being said, I want you to pay attention. He's saying turtles all the way down. We have legend that is already a model in which people are using within the Greek and Roman world and the Jewish world at that. But these are Hellenistic Jews. These are not your typical what we imagine in Orthodox Judaism or anachronistically trying to understand what a Jew would be. These are people who are living in a Greek-speaking, Greek-cultured world. And so these are not your strictest, most staunch, what we think of as Jews. So when they talk about Jesus' resurrection, even as early as Paul, we need to imagine already legend and a topos tradition of something like that happening. So I prefer to consider what Dr. Richard Similar is saying today, and I hope you will pay attention as well. You know, we're all familiar with modern Christian apologists. Apologists are self-designated defenders of Christian belief and teachings. Were you aware, however, that the earliest Christians had their own defenders or apologists of earliest Christian belief and practice? I mean, you may notice that the modern apologist makes no or at best highly selective use of the arguments of the ancient predecessors. In fact, most assume that the truth was revealed with Jesus and his closest pupils, and then immediately lost for the better part of two millennia, only to be recovered by Protestant pastors and theologians in the last two centuries. We only need to spend five minutes reading any of those ancient arguments to recognize that modern apologists are in wild disagreement with the surviving earliest Christian apologists. Consider this somber example, one that our guest, Dr. Richard C. Miller, will be unpacking in a soon-to-come episode right here. That's right, right here on Myth Vision, coming from One Apology 21. The earliest and greatest of these ancient apologists, a Samaritan, born and raised in the first century in Neapolis at the foot of Mount Gerizim. 
being a contemporary, had a front row seat to the production and earliest circulation of the documents that we later find in the New Testament. Justin, Justin Martyr, composed his apology in the latter first half of the second century. Here is his best and only defense of the resurrection and ascension narratives. When we, the apostles, New Testament writers, early evangelists, etc., affirm that the Logos, God's firstborn begotten without a sexual union, namely our teacher Jesus Christ, was crucified, died, and rose, and ascended to heaven, we are conveying nothing new, nothing new with respect to those whom you call sons of Zeus. Here, Justin continues by showing the same recognized patterns in examples taken from the classical demigod tradition. Hermes, the interpreting word and teacher of all. Asclepius, who though he was a great healer, was struck by a, a thunderbolt and so ascended to heaven. And Dionysus, too, after he had been torn limb from limb. And Heracles, once he had committed himself to the flames to escape his toils. And the sons of Leda and the Dioscuri. And Perseus, son of Danae. And Bellerophon, who though sprung from mortals, rose to heaven on the horse of Pegasus. For what shall we say of Ariadne? and those like her who have been declared to be set among the stars. Ultimately, Justin draws strong ties to the Roman apotheosis tradition, including the well-known tradition of the eyewitness to the raised emperor. Justin continues, notice the oath involved in the cultic consecration. Justin says, and what about the emperors who die among you, whom you deem worthy to be forever immortalized and for whom you bring forward someone who swears to have seen Caesar, once having been consumed by fire, ascend into heaven from the funeral pyre. Think about this. Who else swears and doesn't lie about what they are attesting? The Apostle Paul. It's pretty clear. The Apostle Paul is swearing left and right about his gospel and what he is teaching as truth. Why is it that he swears constantly trying to say this is true? Is the Apostle Paul aware of the Greek and Roman tropes that we see in the world? Is he aware of what the Caesars say? Is it not common news when something happens to a president today or someone who is famous and well-known? News spreads and people hear about it. This is the same kind of stuff you would hear in the Greek and Roman world, especially in the diaspora, out there in this Hellenized region of the world where these traditions, topos, legends, myths, etc. were all over the place. In a few weeks, I shall bring Dr. Miller on the show to help us unpack this and related texts. The earliest Christians, according to Miller, never did prop up anything like a historical case for Jesus as empty tomb, appearance, or ascension narratives in the New Testament. That was not the purpose or function of such tales. So what is the New Testament? What is going on with the Gospels? What kind of genre are they? Are they some mythoi? Are they a mythological fictional narrative surrounding some guy named Jesus? And right out the gate in Paul, he is already loaded with language that is full of what we like to call theology, but I would almost say mythical teaching. He has a son of God who is seated at the right hand in heaven, who already has overcome death and all these things. Read all of those other Greek and Roman tells. And they, oh, they also overcome. They also ascend. They also do the same things. It's literally walking like a duck, talking like a duck. And then we get to Paul and we think, eh, no, this is real. Like he really thinks that this is something 
really authentically true. But if we read the same thing about those who swear consecrated to the Roman imperial cult and those who had apotheosis on the Caesar side that Justin Martyr mentions, or those who are deified mortals or, or gods who become more than what they were before, etc. Like all of these stories, we see stuff that we find in Jesus's narrative, but we're believing this fiction to be true. And that goes for the Christian. But for those who aren't Christian scholars or Christians who are trying to make this somehow fictional narrative true in their own life, how do they understand it? Are they starting on the wrong foot by saying, no, 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 this is historical. When we're reading Paul in his 1 Corinthians 15 creed, when we're reading Paul in his description of Christ, we're, we're reading a little too much historical reality into what Paul is suggesting here. What if it is a myth away right out the gate in Paul? This does not mean there wasn't a historical Jesus, even though mythicists would see a lot of reason to latch on to what I'm saying here. You could be a mythicist or a historicist and see what I'm saying. 15, 20 years after the time that Jesus is dead, if you take the historicist model, the legend has already developed. In fact, Richard C. Miller mentions in his book that in one of the accounts of an apotheosis of the Caesar, it was only a couple of days after the Caesar died that the, the, the tell, the, the legend, the myth had already developed and there was already eyewitnesses swearing that they had seen him ascend into heaven and some had seen him after death, just like the Romulus tell. So, we're going to unravel this. It's going to get unpacked. And I hope that you are having a wonderful Easter. But I need to say this. Support those who are kicking butt and bringing the insights to you. There's several YouTubers, including what we're trying to do here at Myth Vision. And how can you do that? A lot of people might comment and say, I can't afford it. I'm not asking for those who can't to help. If you can, sure, help out. We can use it. But it's liking the videos, subscribing to the channels. It's about sharing the content out there on social media. It's about leaving a comment so the algorithm picks us up and engaging with other comments that are down there that you may disagree with or you agree with. Let's create a community where we're dialoguing. That's how we can grow this. And if you haven't purchased Richard C. Miller's book, I hope that you can afford it. It is a scholarly monograph, but if you can't, stay tuned. We're going to unravel some of the stuff he's written is out there for free. There are articles you can read about what he's doing. His work about the missing body of a, of a figure in a translation fable has impacted several academics, and they have quoted him as well from Dennis R. McDonald, Robin Faith Walsh, several other amazing scholars that I seriously appreciate their work on, recognize he's on the right track with his translation fable trope, and that this is what's going on when Jesus is missing from the tomb. So on your Easter Sunday morning, and the Lord has resurrected, just remember what a heck of a tale. And never forget, we are Myth Vision. <laughs>